I wanted to provide you with a few comments on the play Trifles by Susan Glassbull, some things you may or may not have considered as you uh, read through the play. And I especially had you focus on um, themes, and there was more than one that you could mention. A couple obviously having to do with gender differences uh, stands out, but also the kind of the issue of um, is there a higher law <laughs> or a law that subverts the legal definition of someone who is guilty? Uh, it gets into those complex, thorny issues of, um, of context and why people do what they do. And um, this is actually a theme that will be continued in the next play that you read, Antigone, uh, which is a Greek tragedy. But the idea about there being, is there a higher moral law and, you know, the, this question is one that maybe you don't find at all debatable. But obviously the play is trying to show the nuances of people when provided with enough information and the decisions that they make uh, in, a, in what may be an unjust system. So um, just a few more, uh, some, inf some things to think about here. A little bit of background. Um, Context for one act plays themselves. Obviously, they're they're pretty limited, uh, both in duration and in time frame. Uh, often, there's only one setting. That, like in this play, you know, you've got this one kitchen. Even though people reference going upstairs or going to the uh, to the outside to the barn or going into another room, the play itself takes place entirely in a kitchen. Um, and we'll talk more about setting in a minute. Also, there are very few characters. Notice that there are five in this play. You've got um, a neighbor, a Mr. Hale, his wife, Mrs. Hale. You've got the um, sheriff, Mr. Peters, and his wife, Mrs. Peters, who is quote unquote married to the law. And then you've got um, the um, county attorney whose job it would be to prosecute whomever they charge. And in this case, it looks like they're charging um, the character of Minnie, who actually never appears uh, in the play, she's just referenced. So much of what we know both about about um, Minnie and her now dead husband um, has to do with what people have said about them and what you can infer about their character. Um, so the rights were, you know, they never are actually on stage. The action's already taken place as far as the murder, and so now the mystery is, it's a whodunit, um, but a whodunit with a few twists, okay. Uh, this play probably takes about, you know, that if you did listen to the audio tape, because plays are meant to be heard, they're meant to be, well, they're meant to be watched, obviously, but but also um, the way that, that the lines are set up, they're meant to be heard, and so that's the reason I gave you an audio recording. I'm sure you can probably find some video recordings as well of the plays being performed. Um, this play later became uh, a short story that Susan Glassbull, she turned it into kind of a, a short story called A Jury of Her Peers. Um, now, at the time, she got this idea because um, Glassbull was a reporter, and she was reporting on a similar type murder situation of where a woman seemingly kind of went crazy and killed her husband in Iowa. And so that's how it sort of morphed into this idea for a play and then ultimately became a short story as well. Uh, it was first produced in 1916. And if you understand the context, and this has to do with setting, and we'll talk a little bit more about setting in a second, but it was first produced in 1916, and of course at that time women had few civic responsibilities or options. Um, they couldn't they couldn't vote. This was pre um, suffra, um, the suffragette movement, or it was during the suffragette movement. But the suffragette movement had not been successful. If you know anything about you know your history from this period uh, to to this point, so women couldn't vote. They couldn't sit on juries. Um, the whole, so the whole idea of a jury of her peers is kind of an ironic idea. And this play is filled with irony, and that's another thing we'll talk about briefly. Um, in some states, women couldn't own property, so you can kind of see how a woman, and it's not that divorce was unheard of necessarily, especially in larger cities, but it was pretty uncommon. 
because there were few options that women had, you know, return to their families if they were divorced for some reason. Um, there were not a lot of professions that were open to women. There were not a lot of, um, you know, very few women at all had access to, to higher learning, to uh, colleges. And so um, options were limited. I mean, and, the ex and there was sort of a societal expectation. Now, of course, this is a generalization. It doesn't necessarily apply across the board. But it, it, the generalization is pretty much so that the wife, you know, in some states couldn't even hold property. So it's, it's almost in some respects like, you know, the wife belonged, went from the, the family and the father's house to the husband's house. And, you know, that was her responsibility. That was her domain. Um, and, you know, roles for men were restrictive as well. I mean, it's, there, there was an expectation on them as well. Um, so, again, it's, you know, in some of the more progressive cities, perhaps things were a little bit looser, but, but for the most part, certainly in rural settings, it was a very hard life um, and, and still can be, you know, in terms of just physically working a farm, it's an exhausting uh, profession um, if you don't have a lot of people helping you. And, of course, the Wrights didn't have children, as we, as we know from the play. So... Um, Let's talk about setting. So, of course, given the time frame, setting is that time period. Um, it's also winter, and of course, you know, good students of symbolism, uh, winter is kind of the death of things. And so there's a lot of snow, it's very cold. Um, there's a lot of references to fire, which um, you can look at as being symbolic. The fire had gone out. Um, we're going to discuss symbolism a bit more in a minute. And then, of course, the place. We know it's Nebraska simply because there's a reference to Omaha and the um, county uh, attorney uh, coming back from Omaha. Um, so it's a, a rural, isolated, Midwestern farmhouse described literally in the text as being down in a hollow off the road. So it's kind of like in a hole, right? And we know that the kitchen, literally from the stage setting and the and stage direction, it's described as gloomy. And the men, while they're in the kitchen, make it very clear that they sort of blame many rights housekeeping, you know, the, of the place being so gloomy. But um, a little bit later in the play, you know, Mrs. Hale makes the point. Mrs. Peters is unfamiliar with the rights. Um, she's just there as uh, functioning as the wife of the sheriff who's come to get some things for this woman they're holding in the jail cell. And... So she's unfamiliar with the background, with the house, and Mrs. Hale described the house as being gloomy mainly because John Wright was in it, and he himself being, you know, not uh, not the the cheeriest person. As a matter of fact, you know, to speak about characterization for a minute, a couple of things that you notice or that we infer is that um, the the county a, a attorney evidently is a, a political post and he's every inch the politician you know con he's condescending but he plays to the women he um to some extent um and and his whole goal is to find a motive for this murder um they've taken many in because she behaved so oddly and there's no signs that anybody else had actually entered the place, but they're there looking, you know, can't figure out why a rope was used when there's a gun in the house and, and that kind of thing. Um, but so he's, he's sort of a politician. Um, Mrs. Peters initially, she's the character that actually changes in the play to some extent because Mrs. Peters starts off, Mrs. Peters reference is always, but the law is the law. You know, we've got to follow the law. And then you'll notice by the time the play is over that Mrs. Peters is trying to help hide the evidence. Um, Mrs. Hale ultimately ends up with that bird <laughs> in her pocket but because Mrs. Uh, Peters can't stand to touch it. But by the time they finish discussing, and, it didn't, and, and, and one of the sub-themes in this play has to do with how we recognize and identify with other people who've gone through what we've gone through. Um, if we can somehow connect with their human experience and makes their actions a bit more understandable um, instead of and, and sort of strips that whole idea of the law as the law. Um, 
Now, again, I'm not trying to say murder is justifiable uh, necessarily in this case or in any other. That's not my point. Um, but those are the types of issues that are being raised here. And as we know, by the time this the, the play ends, the women have decided whether Minnie's guilty or not, and it certainly looks like she is, they're not going to, um, they've found her innocent uh, because of her situation and because of who John Wright basically was. And some ideas here that he was a violent man. Um, at the very least, you know, the whole idea of what happened to the bird and the bird cage are um, to them some evidence of how he literally took the life out of, metaphorically, out of his wife um, from living with him. Now let's talk, since we're getting into symbols, let's talk about the obvious. The obvious symbol, the canary. I mean, literally, it is a simile in this play because at some point Mrs. Hale, who's giving Mrs. Peters some background information, says, you know, Minnie Wright was like a canary. She used to sing, right? She was part of the choir. She was at church. She was a cheery little thing. Uh, and so, um, and can canaries, if you're familiar with them, are, are bright yellow birds, and you know they do they do sing, and they're um, very vivid and uh, and lovely. And so the idea here is that this that marriage has it, it's sort of reminiscent of Aunt Jennifer's Tigers that poem that marriage is basically to an oppressive person has sort of taken the life out of many right. And so um, Mrs. Hale draws a draws a connection, you know, set and basically said that that Minnie was like a canary. Now the birdcage shows the violence, right? The whole idea of of um, if you piece it together, <laughs> kind of like we're piecing a quilt together. If you piece it together, um, you know, John Wright got tired of hearing the birds sing. He wanted things quiet. And so he went over, jerked that cage door open, and so we know that the door is kind of is broken, and and basically you know broke the bird's neck. And part of the irony, and we're going the last thing we'll talk about is irony. Part of the irony is that she kills him the same way, uh, or allegedly kills him the same way that he killed the bird, um, you know, with the rope around strangling the life out of him. And that's also part of the irony because that's metaphorically what's happened to her. Now, of course, we've got winter, so we've got the dead of things, the stillness. So you're, you're talking about a house that's already still due to lack of children and due to the fact that John Wright doesn't want people around. Um, and we know that his wife, for example, you know, doesn't even, he, we know he's tight with money. Part of the characterization here is, you know, Mrs. Peters says, well, I heard that John Wright's a good man. And Mrs. Hale said, uh, and this, uh, these are lines, um, let's see if I can find the specific line numbers. Um, the reference to many being like the bird starts roughly line 10, maybe 110, 108 to 110. Um, and a reference to her, uh, with her white dress and her blue ribbons, that's line. Those that begins in line um, lines roughly 131, I think. Um, and then the reference to um, to John Wright himself, and it discusses the fact that yeah, he was good. It starts. Uh, I think it's. Line number one, line number 102. Sorry, I'm having trouble deciphering because I do it in clumps of, of fives. Uh, and Mrs. Hale says, you know, Mrs. Peter says, not to know him, I've seen him in town. They say he was a good man. And of course, that's that whole idea of being a good man is ironic. Um, given the context, like even the other men say how tight he was. They'd come by, and we'll talk about the party telephone in a second, but to try and get him to join up and actually kind of connect with the rest of the world. And he wouldn't, but, you know, they didn't expect much of him. They said, you know, the men themselves say he's a hard man. Um, and Mrs. Hale said, yeah, he's good. He didn't drink, and he kept his word as well as most, and I, get, I guess, and he paid his debt. But then she reinforces that idea of what a hard man he was. 
how he didn't he wanted things quiet and um so that's kind of you get this whole idea of a real stillness at that place until this rage um kind of kind of broke out uh, and then the quilts, you know, we've talked about the quilts assembled before, especially with everyday use. And the whole idea of quilts, quilts are warming, quilts are homey, quilts are generational, quilts are, and we think of them as being sort of women's, um, often it's a way that, that women kind of supply, um, usually they work together in quilting, at least uh, that used to be the case. Um, quilting different pieces and then they would have what they call the quilting bee and everybody would sit around and help each other with different parts of quilts. Um, so it used to be a communal activity and of course, you know, this is the first sign, well actually the first sign that something really had gone wrong there, you'll notice that there was bread setting out and um, that had just been a, a, a presumably baked the night before and nothing had been done with it. And I think that was the first sign that Mrs. Hale saw and was kind of taken aback by that because that's that's an indicator that something went wrong um, because all of the effort that goes into kneading bread and letting it rise and then kneading it again and then letting it rise and then baking it it's, it's quite a process and so no one would just leave it out to spoil after going through all of that um, so that's actually the first indication that something had gone wrong in that house but the but the real um, you know incident that set the women on this path of kind of figuring things out was the quilt that the, there had been very steady needlework and to a point and then the quilt the needle point got very erratic it got um it quit falling a straight line so something had upset Minnie as she was working on this quilt sitting there um, and then of course it things escalate with the bird cage and then finding the bird um, so some of the less obvious symbols, and there are others, obviously, uh, things that kind of function, they mean what they mean, and they mean something larger. Um, notice the exploded preserves, how worried she was about um, her, uh, Minnie was from jail, about her preserves. But the thing about preserves, um, if you've ever canned, you know, grown fruit, picked it, cleaned it, you know, got the pulp out of it, cre and created some type of, you know, preserves or jelly or, or jam, that is such a process. And then you have to boil it and seal it and all that. And so she, uh, the fact that she was so worried about it, but what things in the house got so cold because the fire went out, you know, this was a period of time when they were reliant on that fire to keep, um, to keep the house warm. That, this is, that's reminiscent almost of um, those winter Sundays, if you think of that poem, and the whole idea of the father getting up even on Sunday mornings and, and getting that fire started so the house wouldn't be cold uh, when everybody got up. Well, the whole idea is if your fire goes out, and that too is metaphorical um, or, or in symbolic, you know, if the fire goes out and everything freezes, in this case, the glass is exploded. And um, and so exploded preserves, and it's not just any kind of preserves. They were red, you know, it was cherry preserves. So those it, it just exploded everywhere. This explosion of red, and of course, red being rage. Now, is it? Can I be reading into this more than that's there? Sure, maybe, but it definitely does reinforce that idea of of something suddenly happening, and this this idea of rage. Um, the party telephone at the very beginning. Uh, I'm sure next to none of you would remember back when there were party telephones but when i was a kid on my grandparents farm they had a party telephone and at that time especially in rural settings to make um to put in a telephone to make it affordable essentially you shared a line with like three or four or five other people and an operator would actually ring whichever household it was um that somebody was calling but so the, the phone may or may not have been for you if it rang, but you had to actually join and be part of the party line and be willing to pay for it. And, of course, John Wright, that's um, how the men initially, uh, Mr. Hale um, had found John Wright and, and Minnie Wright and discovered what had happened as they were stopping by to see if he wanted to be part of the party line, not expecting him to join. And so that whole idea of being disconnected, right, being isolated, not being part of community. And we know that Minnie Wright, you know, wouldn't even go to church anymore because 
John Wright was tight, which basically means he was tight with money, so she didn't have nice things. She didn't have an, a, anything new to, to wear out. And so Mrs. Hale figures that is the reason that um, Minnie Wright refused to, to leave the house. And then, of course, the physical setting itself, the whole idea of being isolated, being down sort of in a hole, you're in a hole, you're stuck, um, you're off the beaten path, you know, it's rare that anybody comes your direction. Um, that, too, kind of is symbolic of the this, of this situation that many found herself in. Now, the final thing we're going to talk about is, yes, ladies and gentlemen, irony. Um, irony... Um, is, there's irony throughout this play from the from the title trifles and trifles means insignificant things okay and so um, the whole idea that that insignificant and there's these things are so insignificant they're quote unquote women's things and the men through all their efforts to find a motive dismiss or overlook the motive, all of the evidence of a motive, because they don't consider them significant. They're trifles, but that's ironic, right? Because it is these small things. It is the bread setting out. It is the the handiwork on the quilt, you know, going sideways. It's the the bird cage ripped open. It's and then of course the dead bird. The women piece together everything that happened, you know, and, and could see and could see the motive, uh, and then chose to not reveal it. Um, so that's the title itself is ironic and then of course revealing sort of the attitudes nothing here but kitchen things i mean the men are so dismissive and condescending toward the women in the kitchen and many right and and, uh, and you know in a man's world those things were not um were not significant but they actually meant everything in trying to understand what happened in this murder. Um, other evidence, I'm going to throw out a few other ideas about um, some, some examples of irony in the, in the text. Um, you know, you, you notice that the men do focus on like they go upstairs to the crime scene, then they go out to the barn. Right, like there's something in the barn that's really going to reveal uh, what happened in the murder here. I mean, so but that's kind of has to do with that attitude of th those are men area, you know, the man's area, and so those are the things that they would um, that they would check. And notice the county attorney says, um, you know, I guess we'll go upstairs first, then out to the barn and around there. You're convinced that there is nothing important here, nothing that would point to any motive. And notice the sheriff says nothing but kitchen things, you know. So, nah, you know, he doesn't see anything going on there. Um, and then notice that um, Mr. Hale says, well, women are used to worrying over trifles. Um, but it's those little things, of course, ultimately even having that bird. You know, Mrs. Wright didn't have children. She has a bird. They start you know, Mrs. Peters and Mrs. Hale start thinking about what, how lonely it must be and how that little bird probably cheered her. And, and that's it, such a small and significant thing, but it was the breaking point for her, right? Um, and then notice that, you know, the whole idea of it not being a cheerful place, the men blame on her and her housekeeping. All the while knowing what kind of a man John Wright was and, and, uh, but the women, of course, interpret it um, somewhat differently. Mrs. Hale says, uh, I don't think a place would be any cheerfuler for John Wright's being in it. And then um, some other ideas about, you know, and it's, you know, she talks about how Minnie Wright kept to herself and, um, you know, that she was isolated. Um, Mrs. Peters reinforces throughout the law is the law, the law is the law. But that, that part of the irony of that, you know, and the, and the law must prevail and, the, and, and justice must be done. But notice how Mrs. Peters changes to define justice at the end of the story uh, when it came down to it. Uh, the sheriff keeps, and, and the men more than once say, 
they wonder if she was going to quilt it or just knot it, which were two forms of, of quilting, uh, not of putting the squares together, but then of actually sort of tacking it down to the stuffing. You can quilt literally hand sew or knot it. Um, and But that's ironic because, of course, tying back to that whole idea of the rope being knotted around his throat, but that's mentioned more than once. Uh, the men say it sarcastically. They're kind of making fun of the women. Uh, but in truth, the irony is that that's one of the pieces of evidence that would literally indicate that Mrs. Wright is guilty. Um, the whole idea of Mr. Wright being described as a good man because he pays his debts and he doesn't lie. He doesn't drink. You know, the definition of good there is, is somewhat ironic um, from what we come to know about him. Um, and then notice, too, now this isn't necessarily irony, but it, but in a way it is. Mrs. Hale comes to regret that she did not see more clearly what was happening with many rights. You know, she, all she did was she didn't want to come and visit them because the place was gloomy. It, it was oppressive. You know, she herself didn't want to show up, not because of Minnie Wright, but because of John Wright. And uh, so and so she regrets instead of, a, you know, she knew there were probably issues, but in, in, the, in the Minnie Wright was isolated. But instead of seeing her and helping her, instead she just sort of kept to herself, kept away from them because she didn't want to be a part of that gloom. Um, and that's part of that guilt is part of what drives Mrs. Hale, I think, to, to work to support, um, you know, very tacitly support uh, many right now. Um, and then Mrs. Peters begins to identify because Mrs. Peters knew what it meant to, to lose children and then talks about that cat and the brutality of, of um, what had happened to a cat. Um, that she owned, and so she begins to um, to identify with her that way. It's that identification and understanding of somebody's deep pain that actually drives their motivation. Notice Mrs. Hale says, I might have known she needed help. I know how things can be for women. I tell you, it's queer, Mrs. Peters. We live close together and we live far apart. We'll get, we all go through the same things. It's just a different kind of the same thing. Um, And then notice that um, Mrs. Peters, you know, they find the dead canary. They try and laugh it off. Mrs. Peters says, oh, if the men saw this, wouldn't they laugh? But it's kind of that guilty laughter, like like that aha moment when you, the puzzle pieces are coming together, but you really don't want to see it. Um, and then about that time, the men come in and talk about, you know, they're looking for the motive. And, of course, the motive is right there. Um so that provides a little bit more context and explanation for what happened in this very short play. I, I hope it was helpful. So a lot of it you may have already kind of figured out, um, but some of it, you know, you may not have noticed. So I wanted to be sure and, and cover and make sure that you had a good understanding of what was happening here.